Everyone, hi, uh, this is Bruce Muffson back for round two. Kendrick Lamar going to break down another one of his songs and give some clinical perspective about it. And this time I'm going to talk about PTSD. Uh, for those of, you, those of you that are watching, I did get a haircut. Yes, yes, yes. Getting a little bit uh, shaggy there and I got a little bit of a trim. We're going to do the same format. We're not going to change anything. We're still going to go with I'm going to go over some interviews that Kendrick did. We're going to listen to the song. This song is a little bit interesting because there was no actual video. It was just like the picture and then boom, 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 the song itself played. And then I want to go over, in this case, I want to go over what is post-traumatic stress disorder, a very misunderstood clinical mental health term. So once again, my good friend Rob is behind the scenes. You're not going to see him, but he's manning the camera, doing all the do's and dads. And he did a great job on the first one, by the way. So excellent job, Rob. I want to give him a little bit of a shout out. So here we go, and we're going to go right into it, no problem. Um, Kendrick did an interview on MTV with, I'm assuming this is a regular DJ. I'm so old, I remember they actually played videos on uh, MTV and had VJs. So it was a little bit different seeing this young man, but he did fine talking with Kendrick. His name is Rob Markham. And they were discussing the album to Pimp a Butterfly. And in the interview, Kendrick admits to struggling with depression, suicidal thoughts. And what's interesting to me was the balance of two different lives. On tour, where everything is thrown at you, women, money, fame, alcohol, and drugs, and the false sense of, like, we love you, and his humble beginnings from Compton. And it's very interesting. I was telling this to Rob. Since World War II, every famous entertainer, whether it's been music, sports, TV, film, video, they always go to dark glasses. It's so interesting to see that. I see everyone with shades. Why? And they've said this comment before, fame is very bright and it's very, it, 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 it illuminates you and you need the shades to try and keep you hopefully a little bit balanced. So when, when, when Kendrick's talking about, I came out of Compton and I came from literally nothing and now I have everything, so to speak, how do you balance it? Who was your real friends? Who can you rely on? There's an expression called Praktorium Guard. Caesar had this, like his soldiers that he knew he could trust, that he could be with, real with. Who was Kendrick really real with? And on tour, and when you're being told that you're insanely popular by millions of people, and you travel around the world, it gets blurry. It gets confusing. So I understood that comment for me as a clinical social worker really well. Who are you? What are you? Where are you coming from? Where are you going? And you stay true to yourself. You have expression a lot, my boys, my crew, my posse, my people, my peeps. Who are you true with? And I understand how he's dealing with that right now and trying to keep himself quote quote centered. Now it's interesting also, he talks about a survivor's guilt, a feeling of powerlessness. Friends and family can't get out of Compton. There's only so much you can do for people. And it's interesting, uh, listen, I come from family, cuckoo a little bit. And um, you try and talk to them about making better choices, not being so self-destructive, trying to be happy. It doesn't always work. And I didn't come from nearly, you know, I'm not even going to pretend a, a background like Kendrick. Own trials and tribulations that we all go through. But I get it. You know, you say to someone who's dealing with drug and alcohol addiction, we're in a terrible relationship where self-loathing, where self-hatred, can't get themselves together, can't hold a job, can't have a relationship, can't relate to their kids, where kids are self-destructive. And you try and say to them, don't do this, don't do this, you know, pulling them, pulling them. Like, what is a good friend? A friend does this to you, takes you by the scruff of your, of your shirt and pulls you back when you're about to screw up. And I'm sure for Kendrick, that's painful. Look where I came from, look where I am now, friends, and you're not doing it. And I can't bring you with me. And you find out also with fame, with money, and you think you can provide, you could be a game changer, game breaker. Sometimes it's not enough. And that's painful as you become an adult to realize that. So I got that very, very clearly because I struggled with that with myself, with friends and family. And he talked about living the life, the life, the fame and the glory, and then going home to friends who have funerals. How do you relate to that? 
I come off the stage, 15,000 people going like this, Kendrick, Kendrick, Kendrick. And then you go back home when you were nothing, when you were just starting out, and your friend is dead. And he might be dead because he was shot, he OD'd, he made a terrible choice, he's dead. Now, I've had friends that have passed away, and it shook me, it rattled me. So you think, I came from here, and now I'm here, but my friends haven't come with me. Or I come home, and I find out that my friends are suffering. I just turned 52 this week, and I spoke to some friends of mine who crashed me on my birthday via Facebook. Not everyone is having a happy life. It's hard. Life is hard. And Kendrick speaks about that on his song, about trying to find that balance of who am I, what am I? I, I get it. You're this, you've achieved this, this, and this. And then you come home to a funeral and you realize no one's going to care about your friend. Maybe his mother will. And you sit there and you stand there and you cry and you go to the service after the funeral. You have something to eat. And you're trying to remember what your friend even looked like and the fleeting glances and the things that you shared. And it's painful. I've had friends that committed suicide. Probably about half a dozen over my lifetime. And each one, each suicide, I'll be honest, it rocked me. And I felt, could I have done more? Could I have been a better friend? Could I have been more? Here I am, Mr. Clinical Social Worker, and I didn't pick up on it. So what do I know? So I understand for Kendrick that feeling of powerlessness. I'm so this. And yet, in the end, I'm just Kendrick. And I come home to Compton, and I see what my friends are dealing with, and it hurts. So I get that. <clears throat> and he talks about going off a tour bus and going to funerals. I mean, the yin and the yang of that. You know, here I am. I'm quote, quote, a celebrity. I'm famous. I can do anything. I'm comped for anything. And then I'm coming home to a friend's funeral. You go from the high to the low. And he puts that and messes your brain up. Oh, it will mess your brain up. And having that mental fortitude, that mental stability to handle the positives and the negatives, it's not easy. I get it. And to have people telling you that you're amazing, you can do no wrong, and then you're coming back home, and maybe you talk to your friend via text messages for months, like, don't worry, you can do it. You don't have to go down that course and try and try and try, and it doesn't work. You feel empty. You feel small. And it does affect you, and it's... He's honest enough to admit it. And then he puts down this comment, can I still love myself? Do I love myself? You know, am I happy with who I am? And so many people that you'll talk to when they reach, quote, quote, the pinnacle, they're not happy. You know, the music industry is filled with hundreds, if not thousands of stories of people that were on, on stage, on screen, were like, oh, they have the perfect life. I love them. But yet when they come home at night, they close the door, they, they melt, they cry, they scream, they do self-destructive actions. And that's just, quote, quote, celebrities. How about the average person, the average teen, the average 20-something? Who am I? Do I love myself? I'm so unhappy, I'm slicing and dicing. I'm taking pills. I'm taking drugs. I'm drinking I'm in self-destructive relationships. I don't take care of myself. You know, can I love myself? Do I do I love myself? And that's literally a multi, multi-billion dollar question that the pharmaceutical industry, pharmaceutical industry, tries to deal with through medication, through counseling. But do you love yourself? And so many people, from my experience, don't. They're not happy. For whatever reason, and a lot of reasons are valid. But do you love yourself? Now, he makes a comment also that one of the things that helped him grow as an, as an artist was he traveled. I can't tell you that enough. When I work with kids here in Las Vegas, um, many of them come with entourages that would rival Jay-Z. Okay? Kanye would be jealous of some of these entourages that come into these rooms with like caseworkers, social workers, court advocates, 
acronyms. I don't even know what they are. You know, adoption specialist, behaviorist. I, I don't know what they, even they do. So they all come in and they're all in this room talking stupidity, talking nonsense to this kid that's confused, can't see his family, family's dysfunctional. He's relying on all these people, <laughs> the, the entourage, you know, to, to give him some clarity. And I would often be called the one to do the counseling. And the kids would be bitter, angry, jaded, depressed. What a shock, right? And I would say to them, run. <laughs> run. And I would have a list of traveling carnivals in my office. And I would say, look, they're coming through town in May. I want you to leave this posse of cuckoo. And I want you to join the carnival. You'll see 48 states. You'll see most of... Central America, you will learn Spanish. You'll learn how to fleece the yokels in those stupid games that they play that you can never win. They're all rigged. But you'll adopt a family. They'll, they'll look out for you because the carny people, that's what they're known for is to adopt kids. You know, that you become part of the family, the carnival family. Do it for a couple of years. Get some social skills. Learn some critical thinking. Learn how to make change very quickly. And you'll eat a lot of candy apples, true. But I would say to them, Run, travel, see the world. I can't stress that enough because when you see the world around you, when you see things differently, you grow. What, what, what I find with kids that I work with is they don't have a serious sense of adventure. I live here in Las Vegas, Nevada, which is one of the most exciting cities in the world, and I tell kids, have you ever been to the Strip? Have you seen a show? Have you seen a concert? Have you gone to a UNLV basketball game? Okay, we have problems, true, but still, it's Division One basketball. Have you done things? And the answer always uniformly is no. But when you see things, when you travel, even if it's in your neighborhood, you grow as a person. So what does he say in his interview? He knew he would be all right when he went to South Africa because he was going to a concert on the way, and he, and he his cars traveling, and he sees a homeless person. And the homeless person had a good attitude about things, was in chipper spirits. And he said, here in Las Vegas, you know, no, I'm sorry, Las Vegas, where he grew up in Compton, the homeless people were aggressive, nasty, you made fun of them, you threw things at them, and you ran from them. Not that different from Las Vegas, Nevada. We have a huge homeless population here. And I've been accosted hundreds of times at street corners, at Walmarts, all kinds of crazy stories. So when he traveled, he realized, whoa, you know, it's a different world out there. And poverty, which is, I'm sure is dreadful in Compton, is even worse in other countries. So I'm grateful for what I do have. Perspective. Looking outside himself. That's growth. Any of you watching this, get a sense, a sense of adventure and just try and get out of your system and go to another system. And learn about yourself through travel. Now, he also talks about not having control in the interview. Can't do anything about it. He puts it in the hands of God. And, you know, he talks about being on the road and unable to help family or friends. There is a study that came out that they said if you do these five things, it's almost impossible to have a lousy life. What are the five things? Okay. One, get as much education as you possibly can. Two, don't get divorced. Three, avoid alcohol or drugs. Four, don't do anything that's going to hurt you down the road, like, you know, anything self-destructive. You know, you get, and you get that perspective. And then five, have some kind of faith-based system. Believe in something, whatever you believe in. You do those five things, it is next to impossible to have a negative life. It's impossible. They said statistically. People do those five things very rarely. What do they, again, go as far as you can in school, save money, put money away early, don't get divorced, avoid alcohol and drugs, self-destructive actions, and sense of faith. And he's learned that at an early age. I'm not the Almighty. I'm not as powerful as I want to believe I am. I'm reaching out to someone else. I'm reaching out to God. Whatever that is. That's a healthy way of looking at life. I, I'm not capable. 
Part of my job, part of my week is to deal with people that are not going to have happy lives, that are miserable and really unhappy for a lot of valid reasons. And you try and give them a sense of self, a sense of proportion, and sometimes the only thing that people have going on for themselves is God. So he talks about unable to help family and friends, being vulnerable. That's growth. You can't do everything for everyone. And I tell people a lot of times also who are in, in destructive relationships particularly, if a person doesn't want to be helped, you have to let that go. One of the things I like about Rob, he hates to get compliments by the way, um, is that he's grown. He keeps on growing as an owner, as a colleague, as a, you know, he hates to hear this as well, as a mentor as well. But he's grown because he looks at things and he says, I can't be everything for everyone. I got to take care of myself. I have to love myself. I got to be true to myself. I can't, I could say this to people 50 times, but they don't often get it. And I have to move on. And that's another key thing also. And he talks about this in his songs. You, you get frustrated, you get angry at people because they do stupid things, particularly family. You can't let it eat you up. you got to move on because it's self-destructive. And you have to realize that. And being vulnerable. Life is about opening yourself up at times. Is that scary to do? <laughs> of course it is. And I give Kendrick a lot of credit. Because I was telling Rob, I said, hip-hop to me, I'm looking at it completely different now. So that's what he told me about Kendrick Lamar. That I get it. I, I see now, what does it mean to be vulnerable and open yourself up? Now, I'm going to finish that interview. I want to go now to another one he did from, this is from a magazine, Double X's Winter 2014 issue, MTV.com. Talks about, you know, Section 80, Good Kid, Mad City Save My Life. And he talks about, you know, killing myself, scars on wrists, pupils dilated on immense and drugs, teens listen to him. And... It's interesting now, people begin to realize when you just use the term drugs, it's more than just, okay, crack, you know, crank, coke, whatever that is, weed. People are now realizing prescription drugs were drugs prescribed by psychiatrists that are often making bad calls on kids, particularly on kids, particularly on African-American kids, which drives me crazy. But I said in the first video, I don't know if, if that's the case for you, Kendrick and Compton, but here in Las Vegas, every black kid I've ever worked with is bipolar. I kind of find that hard to believe. So they're on medications, heavy, heavy, heavy medications, and their emotions are not allowed to come to the surface. Like we're scared of what we're going to hear, what we're going to see, but all oh, we'll sedate you. Like a nappy time. But, we're not, but, but, you, but if you don't learn how to become vulnerable, if you keep everything in a mask, how do you grow? And he said that teens listen to him, understandable, and he hates the idea of being famous because he doesn't want to be detached and he wants to throw away, he wants to be humble. And the question becomes, as you go higher and higher, the plateau gets higher and higher, who do you really trust? Who are your friends? Who can you honestly listen to that's going to give you feedback? That's the truth. So many times you hear these songs, the truth, the tr what is the truth? The truth is to be told when you need help, when you're not doing something correct. Can you take feedback? Do you let anger get the worst of you? And I get it. The friends from Compton through his mom, who he grew up with, his identity, it's tough. How do you define yourself? And I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and it's, I've had thousands of people say to me, oh, you're from Brooklyn? You're different. You're from Brooklyn? Oh, there you, well, you got to be a different kind of guy to come out of Brooklyn. Compton, not that dissimilar. I get the concept. Compton, Compton. I get it. And here's what happens also. You get intense paranoia. He talked about this in the, in the, in the uh, interview in the magazine. Always paranoid. All you got is you and God at the end of the day. You can't even trust your close people. Because what do they really want from you? And I'm going to close with this quick story about a um, basketball player. 
Um, and I want to just kind of, you know, clarify something. He plays for Cleveland. We all know who he is. Okay, LeBron James. And he made a comment. They said to him, you know, he's worth, you know, he gets like $20 million. You know, whatever he's getting a year. He has four people from Akron that manage everything for him. And they said to him, why don't you hire like an MBA, CPA, JD, attorney? He says, those guys we hire, we only hire them for a specific job. Like we need an accounting issue. Oh, we need an account. How much you charge? 5000 Thank you. You got us a tax loophole. Thank you. We're done. But we don't bring them in because they didn't grow up with me in Akron when I had nothing. When I was just another ball player. True, a great ball player at an early age. But they were with me. And those are the people I keep close to me. And I get it. You know, who do you really trust in the end? Who are your real friends? In the end, it's just you and God. It's a Jewish expression. You come into this world naked and alone, and you leave this world, in a sense, naked and alone. Because you can't take anything with you. So I get that. And that's, a, that's credit to Kendrick for talking about that stuff. All right, so what we're going to do now is we're going to listen to the song, and I want to go over the lyrics, and then I'm going to break down some PTSD issues, and then we're going to call it a day. Okay, um, in this song, obviously, there was no video, so we'll just work off the lyrics. Um, to me, that initial, you know, like, boom, loving you is complicated, it's very strong, and it, but it's very disjointed. It's like I got like a swirl, like a mist is how I took that opening bar. Like it wasn't like, you know, like a calm, like getting up. It was just like discordant, you know, confusion. Loving you is complicated. Like, you know, like, he, like he's in limbo. And I believe it's referring to himself, and this is from The Pimp a Butterfly, by the way, you. Um, it's himself and his family. Loving you. Loving you is complicated. Loving Kendrick and loving my family is complicated. Amen, brother, to that. I get it. Oh, do I get it. And to me, the top was very strong, very, very strong, very powerful, the middle was like pleading, and the last heavy lyrics, you know, it's like it's like three broken into three, very raw and bleeding. Like he opened himself up like a shell, and he's exposing himself almost naked to the world. That's kind of how I saw that last that last bar. I know your secret, and if I told your secrets, the world no money cannot stop a suicidal weakness. And. Again, referring to himself and to his family. And there's a line here. He goes, watching anonymous strangers telling me I'm yours. That to me was easy. That's Child Protective Services, Division of Family Services, Juvenile Probation, Juvenile Parole, your Public Defender, your Family Court Judge, your Court Advocate, your CASA, Court Appointed Special Advocates, um, your Surrogate parents, your foster parents, your temporary foster parents, your temporary foster parents for unification for parents. I mean, it's confusing. Telling me I'm yours. Yeah, telling me, telling you, you stupid family, take care of me. Not a friend of Kendrick, but just in general, when kids say that, telling you that you have to be, no, you have to have milk in the fridge. Really? Wow, it's impressive. You have to be a parent. And case plan, treatment plan. Oh, we're all going to work on those plans. Everyone sign. That's a biggie. Everyone has to sign that piece of paper. That's really, that seems to be really, really important. Sign, sign, sign. Everyone sign the plan. And um, he goes like this. He goes, a baby inside, just a teenager. Where's your antennas? We all think we're hard outside, but we're weak on the inside. Just a child love you. But where's your antenna? To me, that's he's speaking towards family. Like, where are you to hear my needs? Antennas, like you're the family. I'm hurting. Don't you see that? And I'm a parent myself, by the way. And trust me, I've made thousands of mistakes as a father. But where's your antenna, dad? Where's your antenna, mom, to see I need you? 
I don't have it together. And, you know, he's like, you ain't no leader. I don't need you. The world don't need you. Don't let them deceive you. Numbers lie. Your pride thought money would change you, make you more complacent. I hate you. I hope you embrace it. You know, it's like he, he's saying, you know, how are we regarded? Others and self and others. Our family and ourselves. Money's not going to generally, it will buy happiness on certain levels, but where is it going? How are we looking at it? And loving you, loving you, not loving you, 100 proof. I can feel your vibe and recognize that you're ashamed of me. Yes, I hate you too. Where were you for me when I needed you? Dad, mom, stable, not stable. When I needed you, when I was vulnerable and I was defenseless. Now the next paragraph, we talked about, uh, are you the reason why mom and them leaving? You say you love them, I know you don't mean it. You're responsible, selfish, trials and tribulations are burden. everyone felt it, everyone heard it. Where were your antennas again? That same line. Where was your presence? Where was your support that you pretended? No brother, no disciple, no friend. Break down a family. Talk, 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 but no walk. Where were you for me as my family, as my father? Reaching out. I'm living alone. And then the last paragraph, I know your secrets. Mood swings are frequent. I know depression. And he does the gulp, which I thought was clever how he did the gulp. And you, obviously, it's a bottle. I'm self-medicating. Gulp. Drink, drink, drink my, 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 my depression, hopefully away, my, my bitterness, my loneliness, my sadness. I've never met a happy alcoholic. There's always that depression inside that bottle. And in this last paragraph, it's raw, it's bleeding. He opened himself up like, this is Kendrick. This is who I am. You see me on this, but really I'm this. And I'm struggling to make it all make sense. And to me, what I got out of this, like when I was listening to this, I was I had gotten some ice cream and I saw the swirl of the ice cream coming out of the dispenser. And I thought that song, that, that's what the hook reminded me initially was that swirl of emotions. Who am I? What I'm going to do now, though, I'm going to do, I'm going to go over now some issues on PTSD, one of the most on, you know, really not really, really, really well clarified disorder. PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. It's been around for several hundred years. Just a quick, quick, quickie. It really came out, they finally realized it came out during the Civil War because that was the first time war was, was long-lasting and it was carnage on a, on a huge scale and people were exposed to this. And it got its famous, most famous time during the Vietnam War. Oh, he has PTSD. And since then, it's grown to include a lot of different variations of trauma. But what it is, it's a traumatic event, and if the event is unpredictable and uncontrollable, it follows you. Growing up in dysfunction, growing up, quote, quote, inner city with no stability, trust me, after, after assessing thousands of kids, PTSD is there. PTSD and depression go like this, just like that. Very common. And what are some of the traumatic events? Sudden death of a loved one. Talks about that in Compton. Sexual or physical abuse. That came to me loud and clear. And childhood neglect. Perfect examples of what's going to lead to PTSD. And you remain in psychological shock. And to me, some of the lyrics are like shocking because he is in shock. And your brain is different. Your brain actually develops differently when you have PTSD. The neurons form differently. The pathways form differently because your brain is like it's exposed to so much trauma. Now, what are some of the things that three main types of symptoms? You re-experience a traumatic event and you have avoid, you're avoiding reminders of the trauma if you can and you have increased anxiety and emotional arousal. Some of the things that are going to happen is you're going to have memories of the event, symptoms. You're going to have flashbacks. Yeah, the event's happening again. Nightmares. Feelings of intense distress reminded of the trauma and intense physical reactions to the remind, remain, reminders of the event. <sighs> Pounding heart, heavy breathing, nausea, sweating. 
symptoms of it, avoidance and numbing, loss of interest and things that you used to enjoy, feeling detached, I can't relate to anybody, I'm feeling detached, I'm emotionally numb, and sense of a limited future, you don't expect to live a normal life. Now Rob, again, to his credit, has a company on a lot of different assessments, and it's amazing when I see these young kids, the numbing, the detachment, the loss of interest. You talk to them like, eh, that what they call a thousand yard stare. And also increased anxiety and emotional arousal is difficulty falling or staying asleep, duh. Irritability, outbursts of anger, you can't concentrate, you're hyper vigilant, and you're on constant red alert. And that anger, that outburst of anger, I've seen that a million times. When I talk to people that are undergoing PTSD or depression, anger, anger, anger. Other common symptoms, the anger, the guilt, you blame yourself. He talks about that. I come back to Compton, they're dead, I'm alive. The guilt and the shame, self-blame. Gulp, substance abuse. Depression, suicidal thoughts, I'm alone. No one out there can relate to me. Other risk factors, lack of coping skills, high level of stress in everyday life. And finally, what, how you overcome it is you try and learn to do this. You learn about it, you join a PTSD support group, you, you pursue outdoor activities, you confide, you spend time with positive people. You can't do it alone. And that's what Kendrick is kind of grappling, you know, grappling with. I'm just Kendrick. Who do I confide in? Who do I talk to? That's when good therapy is invaluable. Who can I relate to? Who gets me? It doesn't have to be a therapist, quote, quote, a social worker. It could be a best friend, a buddy, a minister, someone you can, you can open up your chest to, open up your heart to. So I hope that this understanding of what PTSD is and isn't will help you. But the biggest thing is don't do it alone. So many kids slice and dice, drink, drug. That's going to get rid of my depression. My PTSD doesn't. It never does. You got to learn to open up to the right kinds of people. And that's what I wanted to share with this video on this song. I thought it was a very powerful song. I thought Kendrick did a great job with it. It was, it was impressive to me in a lot of different ways, more than I even thought initially. And I'm glad I listened to it. I'm glad I'm doing this video. What we want is your feedback and your thoughts. My man Rob will do some you know, bells and whistles on this to give it, make it more appealing. Get you to come look at our you know, website. We want your thoughts. We want your opinions. How do you find this stuff? Do you like more things to, for us to talk about? Did you find this interesting? Did I scare you looking the way I do? You know, anything we can work with, that's what we'd like to hear. So again, thank you for watching and we appreciate your feedback. Have a great one.